Good evening, I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show with Mary Kissel, the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal and the host of Opinion Journal. Mary and I are Republicans and we're seeking tonight to only speak of Republicans. Conservatives, John. I'm a conservative. All right. We'll only speak of Republicans and Mary will speak of conservatives. Yeah, great. Thanks very much. Okay. And I apologize for splitting my infinitive. I see that all the time and I mentally correct it. It does drive me crazy. It's like a dangling preposition. I know. It's horrible. It's my seventh grade grammar standing right there looking at me. You did it again, John. Yes, I did. Only to speak. We begin with the way things ought to be and are in the House of Representatives right now. John Fund of the National Review Online joins us to visit the tale of Kentucky Representative Whitfield and Paul Ryan. I'll let John give the details. John, a very good evening to you. The way things ought to be, Representative Whitfield is resigning. Why? And what does this mean about Paul Ryan's leadership? Good evening to you, John. Congressman Ed Whitfield from Kentucky has been in office for over 20 years, no ethical problems to date. But starting a few years ago, his wife became a lobbyist for the Humane Society, which is generally considered a goo-goo good group. And he basically told his staff, pay special attention to her, work with her on her bills, all of that. An ethics committee investigation ensued. They found that he had given her special access, access that he wouldn't have given to a regular lobbyist. And But he didn't violate any House rules. He didn't try to enrich his position. There was no advantage. There was no quid pro quo. Nonetheless, Speaker Paul Ryan went to Whitfield and said, it's time for you to go. And yesterday, Congressman Whitfield announced he is resigning from Congress effective next week and leaving. Now, that's a standard that, of Washington ethics that people can aspire to. And, of course, Hillary Clinton, of course, shall we say, falls far short of that standard. Is this a standard that Washington, and I, I will dangle the preposition, has ever lived up to, John? Well, certainly there are many exceptions to this, but I think this shows that Speaker Ryan... Uh, and to to his credit, Speaker Boehner before him, take transgressions by their Republican members very, very seriously. It's a zero-tolerance policy. Uh, Would that Speaker, former Speaker Pelosi or uh, Harry Reid had such a policy with the Democrats. Failed to prohibit lobbying contacts between his staff and his wife. That's the ruling that's in quotes from the House Ethics Committee. What does this tell us about Paul Ryan? Has he been energized by his primary victory? What do you win? Like five million to nothing in Wisconsin? Something like that. Is this an, is this an, is this an empowered Paul Ryan? Well, I think Paul has always known he's going to be winning back home. But I think what this means is that he's coming into his own as speaker. Remember, he was an accidental speaker who got the job on two weeks' notice. I think now he recognizes one of two things. He's either going to have to be uh, a determined opposition to President Clinton or, shall we say, a... uh, a conscience of a Trump administration, if Donald Trump wants to violate the Constitution, issue executive orders of his own that uh, are questionable, Paul Ryan has already said, look, I don't care who's president, Congress has its privileges, the American people have their civil liberties, and we have to have standards. But aren't there signs already, John, that the American people are trending towards Ryanism, as it were, and away from Trumpism? I mean, look at the results of the primary votes on Tuesday. You had Mark Marco Rubio winning in Florida. You had John McCain triumphing in Arizona. These are the architects of the Gang of Eight. These are defense hawks. These are pro-trade guys. This is everything that Trump isn't. Well, you could argue that, and there's some truth to that. I would say it's more likely that they had extremely weak and fragile opponents who never, never caught on and that Trumpism is a unique phenomenon applicable only to Trump, and he certainly does not have acolytes who have anything like his level of success in Republican primaries. Let's speak of ticket splitting. I'm I'm on a momentary strike not to speak of the candidate tonight. I want to speak of ticket splitting. Ticket splitting is a phenomenon that is historically accurate about uh, voters deciding they want a divided government or they like the senator, congressman they have, and yet they are are partisans of fill in the blank. John, do you find evidence of ticket splitting already? Is this is this a presumption? After all, Mr. Rubio had 400,000 more votes in his primary victory 
It was not a light turnout than he did in the Republican primary earlier this year. And John McCain uh, did not did not win just against a weak opponent. He won against what you'd have to say is my colleagues in talk radio <clears throat> disdaining him routinely every day to the Republican voting public. And yet John McCain won handily. In addition, John McCain and Donald J. Trump do not stand together on any podium, to my knowledge. So, is ticket splitting underway, John? Yes, and in general election polling, even more so. Rob Portman is running away with his re-election in Ohio, despite the fact Donald Trump still trails narrowly there. Uh, Joe Heck, a Republican congressman from Las Vegas, is leading his Democratic opponent in Nevada for Harry Reid's seat. Donald Trump is trailing. Hillary Clinton. Uh, and there are other examples of that. Uh, I think the, the, re- the chance the Republicans have to keep the Senate is entirely based on how much they can run ahead of Donald Trump. So far, it's, it's an iffy proposition, but several of them are, cl- have, are living in states where st- voters are clearly making a distinction between, shall we say, the mouth and the brain. But couldn't you make the same argument about uh, Portman in Ohio, big name recognition, he tends towards the left of the party on social issues, so he's kind of a unique Republican. And Joe Heck, where I, I understand there's a lot of outside money pouring into that race supporting him. On bo- well, on both sides. Uh, but you also have a case where Senator Johnson of Wisconsin is now you know, polling better than Donald Trump in Wisconsin. Um, you, ha- you know, it's so obviously an incumbent is high name recognition. I'm just saying, if the Republicans keep the Senate, it's because people wanted to keep their senator and they wanted to have a check on Hillary Clinton, who most Republicans still believe is going to win the White House. I want to go back to Florida, Senator oh. Rubio. Mm. Uh, my count, my memory, looking at the numbers right now, is that Senator Rubio's vote count on the primary was within 50,000 votes of the total vote count for Donald J. Trump in the primary, a vote that he boasted about for many months. John, let's look at Florida, and then I'll ask Mary the Floridian. Are we looking at regrets in Florida, John, after all these months? Rubio won so handily, he's like a, a rocket to higher office in four years. I don't know. I do know that nationally, only 74% of Republicans currently say they're voting for Donald Trump. Uh, In Florida, over 90% of Republicans say they're voting for Marco Rubio in November. So clearly, Rubio is a greater uniter than a divider in the party than Donald Trump is. Well, he certainly trounced his opponent. I'm just reading some numbers here. He he won the primary on Tuesday, 72 to 19 percent. Wow, that wasn't even close. And the position we can figure today from Donald J. Trump on immigration. I thought you were going on strike, John. You were. I was. What's wrong with me? Why am I doing this? I mean, anyway, the position we can figure today is. uh, separated from Marco Rubio's position on immigration. Let's put it that way. There's now separation. Uh, the question here is, is Marco Rubio's position more acceptable to the Republican Party than Donald J. Trump's position? Can we figure it out from these numbers, John? The two safe things we can say is that about 7 out of 10 Republicans do believe that they want some accommodation with people in this country illegally if it does not involve citizenship. Secondly, the vocal minority of Republicans who are really upset about borders and immigration are five times more vocal than the other Republicans, so we hear about ten times more from them in the media. Hmm. Mary, Florida, it turns out to be the bellwether of bellwethers here. Rubio was rejected in the primary vote. Do we know why? Well, Trump had big name recognition in Florida, John. Trump has been a fixture in Palm Beach and Mar-a-Lago for decades. So Floridians know him. They know him from Palm Beach County. They know him from Miami-Dade County. Uh, He's a known quantity. Rubio is a a young guy. He never had a natural constituency in Florida because Jeb Bush took that, and Jeb Bush also took a lot of the money from Florida. So there wasn't a money base for Rubio. Uh, I think Bush sucked a lot of air out of that campaign, and Trump came in as an agent of change. What do you think about the matter of regrets in the Florida vote? Do you believe that after watching Donald J. Trump underperform Mrs. Clinton, it's a Republican year. It's a Republican year. If there there's another well, name on, if there's another name on that ticket, the party's feeling mo- a lot more prosperous right now. You saw how much Mrs. Clinton's campaign raised in August. It's, it's daunting, the cash 
tsunami that's coming after the Republicans. And it's not like the Republicans are poor. They're just keeping their money in their pocket. Yeah, I, I look, the cash tsunami, and, and maybe John can speak to, John Fund, the other right, John, right. can speak to this as well, doesn't always guarantee victory in congressional races. Okay. The presidential race is another issue. And there are different constituencies in Florida that the Republican has to appeal to, to dangle another preposition. Um, one of them being the Hispanic vote, which is increasingly an important vote in Florida, as you see more Puerto Ricans flee that island and move to the Orlando area. Of course, there's the Cuban community, but there's also a big Guatemalan community in Palm Beach County and other areas, Hondurans, you name it. And Trump, in his speeches, is alienating these people right. instead of appealing to them. And so uh, not a smart move, particularly if you want to win the Sunshine State. Final question to you, John. Uh, Marco Rubio, is is this the man in the, in the batter circle right now um, in the party after his success on Tuesday or to be determined after November 8th? I think when he announced that he was returning to the Senate, despite having announced he was retiring, he basically set himself up to run in 2020, either against the President Trump in the primaries or against the second term of Hillary Clinton. We will hear more from him. Mr. Fund has in him the ability to write dystopian fiction. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> I like those scenarios. Or, or talk about the news, yeah. which is, is similar. John Fund, National Review Online, Mary Kissel. The editorial board of the Wall Street Journal and the host of Opinion Journal, I'm John Batchelor, splitting my infinitives. <laughs>